<laughs> All right. So anyway, so what's the purpose of calibration, right? Okay, we talk about calibration. What are we trying to do? Um, so we're trying to remove the offset or bias that's added during conversion from analog to digital, okay? So generally, um, when you're trying to convert something that's analog on your sensor uh, to digital, um, cameras or drivers will add something called a bias because that allows you not to clip pixels that are pretty close to zero, okay? If that makes sense. So it's almost like, you know, a, a number that they add on just so that if something is zero or close to it, it's not going to get truncated or clipped. So, so, so if you said it's simply in math on a linear equation, Y equals MX plus B. Yep. The B term to, to move it up. That's what you're, that's what you're referring so to. So I'll actually get into that. So basically let's assume that, you know, you have one photon hitting a pixel, right? Okay. That let's say generates, you know, one electron, right? Okay. There's going to be some variation in that. Okay. <clears throat> if you don't add a bias, when you convert numbers that are close to zero can become negative and get clipped. Whereas if you add a bias, what's going to happen is that number will still be positive. Okay. And then when you add a number of frames, what happens is if the average of that is greater than zero, that will still show up. Whereas if it was clipped, it won't show up. That's the reason for adding a bias. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> then the other thing that it does is it corrects for average dark current, which includes hot pixels and amp glow. And I'll show you um, an example. Um, the other thing that it'll do is correct for predictable non-uniformities in pixel response. And again, I'll show you an example. And obviously I think most of us are familiar with vignetting and light fall off and <clears throat> things like dust motes and contamination on optical surfaces. <clears throat> the thing that people will tell you um, that I've read, which is not accurate, calibration will not reduce noise, okay? So it increases noise, but the effects can be kept small and the benefits of calibration obviously outweigh the added noise, mm. right? When somebody tells you that calibration reduces noise, <clears throat> it's not actually reducing noise. So uh, just so you know, any questions on this? Uh, I got a question about bias. Yep. Um, uh, isn't there also a component of uh, uh, bias noise added by the electronics itself? Um, so there is noise that, uh, that, okay, let me put it this way. The two types of noise that I'm familiar with for sensors are the noise on the sensor itself and mm. what's called analog to digital conversion noise, right? Okay, so both of those, generally both of those are classified under read noise. Okay. All right. Okay. So when we, yeah. So if you look, um, years ago, I read a paper by a person from the University of Chicago. It's a fairly technical paper. Okay. So, um, and again, we can get into technical details, but um, older cameras, like the older mm -hmm. Canon cameras. Okay. So you had the sensor itself, which basically is a silicon. And then you had circuits that basically converted those electrons from analog to digital. And in the process of doing that, there was noise that was involved, right? Okay. So both of those generally are classified as read noise. Okay. okay? All right. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So what are the types of calibration frames? Okay, so bias frames, right? <laughs> Taken with an exposure time of zero seconds or as close to it as possible. It records, like I said, it records the offset added when the signal is converted from analog. It will depend upon gain or ISO. And one thing to remember is for DSLRs, people will say, take your bias at one over 5,000 seconds or one over 8,000 seconds or what have you. Um, generally, DSLRs cannot achieve those speeds, meaning that the sensor is active for a lot longer than one over 8,000 seconds or one over 5,000 seconds. It's basically limited by what's known as a flash sync speed, which is about one over 200 seconds or one over 250 seconds. Generally, I mean, it doesn't really matter because not much read noise builds up in that amount of, or sorry, not much 
dark noise builds up in that amount of time. But you should know that it's not meaningful to think about exposures like one over 8,000 or one over 5,000 seconds, okay? So um, dark frames record signal in the absence of light. Uh, the next one is important, exponential dependence on temperature, linear dependence on time. This is the reason obviously that we use cool cameras to reduce the dark current and the dark current noise. Um, for those of you that are familiar with statistics, the dark current um, buildup actually follows a Poisson distribution, which means the standard deviation is the square root of the mean, okay? This is really similar to the photon flux from the um, sky itself. That follows a Poisson distribution as well, okay? Was there a question? I am. Okay. okay. So uh, it'll, this will also depend on gain. And what's important is it inherently contains the bias signal, all right? All right. So when you take a dark frame, uh, it'll include the bias signal. And then flat frames, obviously, are optical response to a uniform light source. Um, will record and can correct for vignetting, pixel response, non-uniformity, optical effects of dust, and so on. Will also contain the bias signal, but will also contain dark, right? So, you know, because it's a non-zero exposure, so it contains a little bit of dark current too. So any questions here? <clears throat> okay. So the way that I think about this, if I go back to the previous slide for just a second, after calibration, whatever ADU value that you have is some direct multiple of the amount of photons that have hit that pixel, all right, without a bias. So, you know, if zero pixels hit it, you can think of it as having zero, right? Okay, so it's some multiplicative constant times the number of photons that have been incident on that pixel. So that's what all of this takes care of. Yeah. All right, okay. <clears throat> so the way that I like to think of it is by using this equation. So if you have a calibrated light, that is the uncalibrated light minus the uncalibrated dark divided by the calibrated flat, all right? So if you think about this, the light contains the bias and the dark contains the bias too. So the bias subtracts out here, right? Similarly, if you look at the calibrated flat, it's the uncalibrated flat minus the flat dark, which is basically a dark frame that has the same exposure time as the flat. So in both cases, you can see that the bias cancels out, right? So if you think about it, as long as you take darks that are the same exposure time and at the same exposure temperature as either your light or the flat, there's really no reason to take a bias except to do something that I'll tell you about a little bit later, okay? Does that make sense? <clears throat> So, the so around what? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I've seen it described as a, a master dark, which I'm assuming is a calibrated dark. Is that correct? So uh, again, so let's back up. So when, yeah, so the dark here, I should, I, I, and this is maybe something that I should have written differently. So this is uncalibrated light minus uncalibrated master dark is probably the better okay. way to play it. Okay. okay. So yeah, um, and then calibrate, uh, calibrated flat is uncalibrated flat minus, you know, you can call it master flat dark, right? Okay, or something like that. Does that make sense? Yep. So the way that I would actually- it actually Is it actually the master flat dark or yeah, is it so a flat dark that matches the uh, exposure conditions of the uncalibrated flat? Yes, so that is correct. So. The way that I would do it in practice is let us say that I take 20 flat frames, right? Okay. They are 20 uncalibrated flat frames. All right. They're just whatever flat frames. Okay. Let's assume that each of them was taken at minus 10 centigrade and four degree or four seconds. Okay. What I'm going to do is construct a master flat dark from four second dark exposures. Make sense? Then I'm going to subtract that master dark using the image calibration process from each one of the flats that I took and integrate those, 
Okay. And that's but how the, I the, get, the, the, get the, the, I'm sorry? Uh, that part, I, I think now the, the confusion is I have an uncalibrated master dark versus a master flat So dark. when I say uncalibrated, I mean a master dark from which the bias has not been subtracted. So think about it this way. <clears throat> Let's assume that I want to calibrate a light frame that's 300 seconds long, all right? So what I will do is I will take, let's say 20 dark exposures, each of 300 seconds at the same temperature as the light, all right? Right. I will integrate those without subtracting the bias. Right, and those I would call a master dark. That, that makes sense to me. Yes, and I'm calling it an uncalibrated master dark because I'm not really doing you know, I'm not really subtracting it from that. Yeah, you're just saving it. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saving it. I'm integrating it and saving it, right? Okay. Now to calibrate a single light frame, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the uncalibrated light frame. I am going to subtract the uncalibrated master dark and I am going to, I am going to divide it by the calibrated master flat, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm some combination of this, right? Okay, so I should say probably integrated. Does that, that make sense? It, it does to a point. And, and, and what I'm thinking here is somebody looks at this in the future, right? Because you're still yep. using that master flat dark on the for the calibrated master flat. Yep. It's still an uncalibrated flat dark, right? It it it's just it's just a flat dark, right? So it's an, so when I say master, I mean, I've integrated it, right? So when, I, and maybe I should write this a little bit differently. So you mean by master because I, I took 10 of them? Or 20 of them or whatever. That's what I mean by a master. Okay. Okay. Right, right. So again, this is good feedback because I mean, this is like clear to me in my head, but I'm, when I'm writing it down, <laughs> it's good feedback that, you know, what is being understood and what yeah, is Yeah, so the, the, yeah. I would not be to me the cal the the master dark flat doesn't make sense having master in there. What you're saying is it's just that average of or that is correct, right? Flat. Okay, so, so maybe when, it's the average flat dark. Okay, not yeah. I mean, if that makes more sense, right? Okay, so for me, and a master the is reason. Something yeah, because I've I've been, I've been fighting this terminology with 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 the software I use and stuff on yep. the internet, and it and. And I've been struggling with that. Now this just cleared it up through the discussion of it, but yep. the terminology, it makes way, way more sense. Yeah, now. and I, I, I'll go into the reasons why we take averages and so on in a little bit, okay? So, but basically, I mean, when, when I think about masters, masters are combinations, okay? Whether they're master flat, master dark, right? Okay, and so on. These, right, okay? like this, I would think of as an individual light frame, right? Okay, and then if I integrate that, that becomes a calibrated master light. Does that make sense? Yeah, so Arun, we've got a, a, a raised hand. Uh, Gabe yeah. has a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, question on the first line, uh, uncalibrated light minus uncalibrated master dark. Um, both of those have uh, say, say you take a light where there's um, some region in your frame where there's basically no signal. And this can happen in the case where you have a lot of, um, you know, you're shooting a narrow band object mm -hmm. uh, and there's no signal in a certain region. Uh, so the, the difference between the uncalibrated light and master dark there would give zero on average, but there is a dispersion around that. So I'm wondering, um, are you needing to calibrate or not calibrate uh add an offset here in order to make the calibrated light be positive otherwise you'll have negative pixels that'll get clipped and you'll have a loss of signal in that case i'm I, wondering I know you that, an offset. yeah i know that pix inside allows you to use a pedestal i have not done that gabe i mean that's a good point so like if i were to take this expression and write a pixel math expression for it in order to do all my calibration I feel like I would need to add a, an offset or pedestal, like you say, uh, in that first expression so that I don't have um, negative pixels getting clipped. So yeah, the other way, I, I, I don't know how PixInsight does it, right? Okay, so one thing that PixInsight might do is it might allow you to allow the, ex 
during the integration allowed the pixels to be negative, right? Okay, so that when you combine the average, they still end up being greater than zero, if that makes sense. Um, but if you combine an average, if the if the mean is zero and there's dispersion about that mean and you combine many stacks on that, you're still statistically speaking, you're still gonna get negative pixels. So don't you have to add an offset? That's what actual I'm, that's acquisition what I'm time. So this Isn't is that handled there. So Gabe, if you have no signal, that would be an average of zero, correct? An average of zero, but not pixel to pixel because there's yes, not pixel to pixel of zero, right? Okay, but if you subtract the master dark and get a negative, as long as you're as long as you're recording the negative, okay, mm -hmm. and adding it and integrating it, won't it um, would it still give you an average of zero or close to it? It would still give you an average of zero, but you still yeah. have pixels with negative values. Okay, but then you would. You, you you would have to basically then what what would that mean that they have you know pixels would have negative values so what happens then if you add a pedestal how would that account for it if you add a pedestal usually i've seen around 500 then that means that you have some pixels at say 497 that would otherwise have no information okay it would be set to zero if there's no pedestal okay so what you're describing now is specifically a pix insight how it's handled correct I, I don't know how it's handled in Pixon site. I, I'm just seeing this expression and thinking that your calibrated light is going to have negative negative values in those pixels. And I don't know if it'll be, get clipped or if you have to add an offset such that you won't have them clipped. Yeah. See. So I've never had that. Okay. So uh, that is something that I don't know the answer to, Gabe. But I mean, regardless, okay. So the question of whether you add a pedestal or not, what I was trying to express here is that you don't need to subtract a bias from either the master dark or the um, or the uh, master light, all right? So whether you add a pedestal or not, I would think would be independent of that, wouldn't it? Yeah, I agree that there's no point in subtracting a bias. And that is what I was trying to express. Now, whether you need to add a pedestal or not, that I don't know the answer to. Okay. I've never done it. So, so guys, I got a, I got a question. Is, is this, uh, this whole discussion based on CMOS? Because I, in, in the C, in the CCD world, I've never run into this at all. Uh, actually, you do run into it in the CCD world. I've run into it uh, and the stuff that I'm doing in the software because I do EA live, right? The software I use, there's an offset that you use specifically because so that you have no negative pixels. So that's why this terminology was important to me in, in the very hmm. beginning, because I was thinking through the process um, and my, my calibrated light, that's that light frame. I took a 30, 30 second exposure. I have an offset that when I'm doing all the calibration, it turns all the, the offsets off. When you're running, you, there's a way to measure and look at the sensor of the camera so that you have your offset. So as, as I change uh, gains and or um, exposure times, I found references to the, to the camera that I have with that 294 base of where that offset should be. And I yeah, do some of my work, you know, that way. So, that's, yeah, so that that's offset is to get rid of that zero. So Don, you're still you're still talking CMOS, where you're. Where no, you're, I'm talking CC. I'm yeah, I'm you know, talking CMOS. I'm talking, talking my 294 CMOS, CMOS yeah. camera. Yeah, which you which you're setting gains and offsets. Uh, uh, I I guess that's just something I'm not familiar with. You know, I I can't. There is no gain or offset adjustment on my CCD cameras. So, but Dennis, the point about I think the point about pixel clipping applies to CCD just as it would CMOS. Yeah, there's nothing special with that. It's it's the same math that applies to both. Mm, yeah. It's a, a pixel is a pixel and it has specific characters sure. and that's what we're... Yeah, so the yeah. way you read it would be different between CCD and CMOS, right? Okay, but uh, other than that, uh, the point about pixel clipping, that I just don't know the answer to. What I was trying to illustrate well, here is that you don't need a bias if you're doing it this way. Okay. Okay.
So anyway, this is how I do it. So basically what I do is I take my uncalibrated lights. I have a master dark that I calculate without subtracting the bias. I calibrate the light frames with that and with a master flat. And again, I don't take a bias for the master flat, okay? And I construct the master flat by taking 20 frames or so, okay? And then subtracting the master dark from that and integrating that to get a calibrated master flat. Okay. Now the question of pixel clipping, like I said here, I don't know how that works. Okay. All right. Um, so the only thing that I would say here is this. Um, if you do use a bias, make sure it's consistent with the equation, meaning subtract it from both the uncalibrated light, okay, the uncalibrated dark, flat and flat dark. So, you know, the purpose of looking at this equation like this is if you subtract the bias from this, make sure you also subtract it from that, right, okay? And then also, um, also from here, right? Okay, so if you're using the bias, make sure that you're using it consistently. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is for one shot color, calibration must be done, or uh, I do it typically before debearing. Okay. So questions other than, um, other than pixel flipping. Okay. So no, that's, that, that, that was very good because it confirmed it confirmed how I've changed my process. Thank you. Yeah. So I will share how I think about biases for CMOS, but I'll wait till the end. Okay. So here's an example image from my ASI 294 millimeters, right? This is 300 seconds. I think this is minus 10 centigrade, and you can see pretty severe amp flow here. I don't know that you can see this, but if you, um, but I can see on my screen several, you know, what I'll call hot pixels, all right? Um, so you have that that you need to get rid of and some of the hot pixels too. This is a H alpha flat, again, with my ASI 294. And you can see that I've got what looks like a stain or dust mode here, here. And this is fairly typical of an ASI 294 flat. Mm -hmm. You have significant what I'll call pixel non-uniformity, right? Okay. So the light source here is nominally uniform, at least I think it is, although I haven't measured it. But you can see that here in the middle and here, there's a pattern to it. For some reason, the pixels are responding differently to light here than here. Okay. And I need to correct for that, obviously, right? Now, before calibration, this is what my H alpha light looks like. And you can see the effect of the amp glow here. Uh, I think you can see a little bit of the effect of some of the vignetting here, right? Okay, on the right. Uh, that is from my off axis guider. And then this is a calibrated light. And you can see how I've gotten rid of the amp glow and I've gotten rid of the vignetting as well, right? So long as I'm doing this consistently, even a sensor like this calibrates out fine, all right? So just as an illustration, okay? Okay, so um, some of the guidelines that I put down for taking flats um, need a uniform light source. What I use is a simple tracing pad with white paper on top. Um, and the way that I do it is I just, change the amount of white paper that I add to get the exposure time that I want. Uh, what I, there are, of course, dedicated flat panels that you get. I think you have the flip flat. I think there's something called spike flat and so on. But those I've seen run into the hundreds of dollars and I just haven't found them to be worth it for me. Although, you know, uh, I know other people use them, so. Okay, so. What I like to do is keep exposures at three seconds or larger. And the reason for that is it avoids errors due to inaccuracies and in timing. Especially if you're taking short exposures, um, the driver may introduce an error. So it may not be three seconds each time. It may be 3.1 or 2.9 or what have you. But the larger the time, the less the impact that error has, right? Okay, so that's the reason why an exposure of three seconds or larger is recommended. Um, I aim for a median of one third to one half of saturation, which is 20,000 to 30,000. Um, 
uh, with the saturation value of 65535. Uh, what I will tell you is I've taken flats with ADU values higher than that, 40,000 and so on. And as long as no part of the image is saturated, right? Okay, so if I look at the maximum value, if that is less than 65535, then it calibrates just fine. Um, obviously, calibrate to the flat dark of the same gain, temperature, and exposure. Um, one thing that um, there's been a discussion about, and I found this to work for me, you can take your flats at different gains than your lights, okay? As long as you calibrate those flats with darks of the same gains, right? So with my old ASI 1600 camera, uh, there was a time that I didn't have flats with I think 75 gain and I ended up using flats at 200 gain and it worked just fine, all right? Okay. Um, what else? Flats are filter specific for one shot color, especially if using light filters. I think Jim had a issue with this. Make sure that you check the histogram in each channel. So if your filter blocks a lot of red light, you could end up with not enough light in your, um, uh, not enough light in one of the channels, for example. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is take flats frequently. And the reason for that is if you have a piece of dust that for some reason or the other moves and then you take a flat after it has moved, um, it can create significant problems in your image. And that is really hard to correct. So I try, especially when I'm not taking, um, when I'm taking broadband, I'll make it a point to take flats at the end of each night. So, okay. Um, guidelines for taking dark, same gain exposure time and temperature as lights, avoid light leaks. I mean, I take darks at night in my garage or in a darkened basement. I disconnect my camera from my scope because I'm not a hundred percent sure my scope and everything is, you know, um, light proof. Um, there is a setting in PixInsight called optimized darks when I should say it's not integrating, it's really calibrating. Big, here's the reason why. PixInsight will multiply your master dark by some number to attempt to reduce the global noise, right? Okay, but especially in a sensor with amp glow like this, if you try to multiply this by some number and subtract, you might end up somehow reducing the global noise, but you won't correct the amp glow properly. So you really don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be optimizing darks. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So um, the question, you know, some people may ask is how many darts do you have to take? So the thing to remember here is that both the dark frames and light frames add noise to your stack, right? The action of subtracting darks will add noise, okay? because basically the dark frames themselves contain, you know, the same level of dark current noise as a light frame, okay, of the same integration time. Now, if you increase the total number of darks, okay, you will reduce the effect of that noise in your, int or in your um, integrated light frame, okay? But the question is, should I take 50? Should I take 100, right? Okay, that's the question. The, it turns out that in most cases, about 16 to 20 darks are more than adequate. And this graph with John Hayes shared on Astrobin tells you that, okay? So let's say that you took on the x-axis, let's say that you have 60 light frames that you took. Now, let's assume that you calibrate them with one dark, uh, with one dark frame, right? Somehow, you know, you just decided that you didn't want to take 20 and you took one. This is the amount of noise that you end up with, right? Now let's assume that you go from two, uh, one to two, that reduces the noise dramatically. But you go from two to four, the reduction is less, from four to eight, less still, right, okay? Now, when you get to about 16, after that you can see going from 16 to 32 to 64 to 128, you're not really making a huge impact to the noise, right? So it's already fairly low at 16, going from 16 to 32 reduces it, but not by that much more, right? So you get to a point of diminishing returns. And generally what people say is that, you know, 
um, about 20 darks or so is adequate, okay, in most cases. You'll see actually the square root of n dependence, that's actually pretty common in some of the stuff that we do. Hmm. You'll find that, you know, let's assume that you take a set of lights and there's something called signal to noise ratio, which tells you what the quality of that light is. If you want to double it, you will actually need to collect four times the number of photons, right? Okay, so that's the square root of n dependence here. So again, you get to a point of diminishing returns, right? Okay, so, you know, generally going to more than 20 darks doesn't get you very much. Does this concept make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So uh, one topic that I wanted to talk about was scaling darks, okay? So what's the, so in, in the CCD world, right? Um, one of the reasons that I've heard, I've never actually used a CCD apart from G-scope at one point, but um, the reason that you take a bias is you can do something called scaling of darks. So I mentioned that, you know, we can use the fact that dark current scales linearly with time to artificially construct, you know, or, or sorry, I mentioned that dark current scales linearly with time. You can actually use this to construct darks that have exposure times different from what you have taken darks with. For example, let's assume that you have 60 dark, you know, a, six, a master dark of 60 seconds, 180 seconds, 300 seconds, right? Okay, and you need a dark of 240 seconds. If you had a bias, what you could do is you could take, let's say your 180 second dark, subtract the bias from that, okay? Multiply it by the ratio of 240 to 180, add the bias back, and that'll give you the same effect as taking a 240 second dark without actually having taken it. So that's really the reason to take a bias. And this works, I, you know, what I've heard, yeah. although I've never used it, is it works quite well with CCD cameras. So, so Arun, uh, question: um, Isn't that isn't that built into uh, the calibration process in mm -hmm. PixInsight? If you if you're calibrating an image uh, and you under your darks, you um, you know you're adding the bias and the flats and everything in your in the calibration window. Um, if you if you if you select calibrate dark isn't that what that's doing no calibrate dark would simply subtract the bias from the dark that's all it does yeah that's all it's all doing right. all right okay yeah. so you do want to make sure that that dark that you're using has the same exposure time and temperature obviously right okay as right. you know the light frame but this is let's assume that you don't have that right okay what do you do if you had a true bias this is what you could do right so you think about it, you subtracted the bias from the dark at 180 seconds, you divided by 180, that gives mm. you the dark per second, if you will, add it to two, you know, multiply it by 240 and then add the bias back, right? Okay, so that's how it would work. Okay, cool. Now, and Arun, how do you actually go about doing that? You can do it and you can actually do it in um, PixInsight. So, what I would do is, um, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Let's see if I can do this, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, what I if I had frames, um, you could do, you know, if you had a frame called bias, you could actually do dark. If you had a frame called dark, you could do dark minus bias, right? Into one eight, you could actually write this expression in PixInsight if you will. Okay, so so uh, you're doing it then with pixel yeah. math using yeah, that expression. Right. Okay. Bias. Assuming right. that your frames called dark bias and by you know. Sure. Okay. All right. All right. Now here's a problem though. Okay, for some CMOS cameras, and I know this is the case for the 294, a true bias may be hard to get. And the reason for that is if you take really short exposure times, they end up heating the sensor and you'll get an artificially high bias, right? So if you subtract that bias from your dark, that'll give you erroneous results if you try to scale darks. Okay, so that's the reason why, you know, people say don't subtract biases from CMOS and so on, because the bias that you get by a zero exposure time from a camera like the 294 ends up not being what you think of as a bias. 
okay? Now, you know, there is a trick that you can play. You can use the fact that CMOS exposures are actually much more stable at long exposures to continue, you know, to construct an artificial bias. And I can show you how I did that, all right? So what I did here, uh, can you see my screen? Can yep. you see my spreadsheet here? Okay. Now, what I have is I have here dark frames that I took at six, or a master dark that I made at 600 seconds, 300 seconds, and 200 seconds. Okay. I calculated the average using the statistics function in PixInsight, right? Okay. And then I plotted this, and it'll give you a straight line with an R square of 0.96, roughly. Okay. So what you can do then is you can find out what the intercept of that line is, all right? So basically what happens if you extend this line to an exposure time of zero? And that is the mean value, okay, of a true bias frame if you could get it. Does that make sense? So what I'm doing in a CMOS camera, I can't really get a true bias, okay? But what I'm doing instead is plotting the mean of the dark frames that I do have of much longer exposures and extending that line to zero and finding out what that value is, right? Okay, and that is the mean bias that I have. Mm. All right. Now, if I have that, and by the way, this is not mine. This is John Upton who came up with this. What you can do is you can take your dark that you have, let's say at time T1, you can subtract from that the calculated bias, right? Multiply it by the same ratio of times, add back the calculated bias, and this actually will give you something that will work quite well. So, you know, for the recent comment image that I shared, I didn't have 60 second darks. So what I did was I actually used this to make an artificial 60 second dark. And it did a good job of, you know, calibrating um, the 60 second light frame. So that's how, you know, I have done calibration or scaling of CMOS darks and it seems to work reasonably well. Okay. All right, so this is actually, you know, this is kind of what I want to cover and maybe, you know, we can talk about questions that people have or. Yeah, we've got, uh, we got about you know, 10 minutes for, for questions. Or I'll take the extra 10 minutes. <laughs> so the, the, the question I have for you to get a three second exposure and what roughly how thick is your pad of pa white paper? <laughs> it depends um, upon, yeah. And so what it, gain, how, how do you, how do you set it? Do you, what gains do you use on the camera? Cause yeah. I'm because of the, the meeting a month or two months ago, where we just did some open discussion about this. Um, I dropped my gain way below a hundred to be below the switching point, but I still can't get out to three seconds. I was, it was like, you know, a quarter of a second yeah. uh, to be able to do that with my setup. So how, you know. So all, the only gain that I've used with my um, 294 is 120, right? Okay, I've not tried any other gain. And um, with my tracing pad with a, for narrow band, I end up having to use, um, two or three sheets of paper, okay? Okay, it's not that much. It's not that much. Now, when I'm doing broadband, it ends up being, you know, if I'm doing luminance, it ends up being about, you know, maybe nine or 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I also use a sketch pad. I have the larger size sketch pad, but I also bought on Amazon an acrylic sheet. I want to say it's uh, three eighths of an inch thick to a quarter inch thick. I don't remember anymore, yeah. but it was like sandblasted on one side. So it's frosted to help uh, disperse the light and get equal, you know, a nice flat uh, energy level. Let's just say, I don't know about the color. I don't know how well the color is, color is but, but, um, but I haven't put paper in there. So I'll have to try that because 
to to get a longer exposure because i understand your point about the the uh, trigger basically the shutter speed trigger speed whatever you want to call it and that variation that makes sense to me yeah uh, yeah the reason i think for the four second or the three second is the is the inaccuracy in the time right okay so mm -hmm. if you're taking a quarter second dar or you're taking a quarter second flat then if you have a certain error right okay that will be a larger proportion of your time than if you you know take a longer exposure yeah. So that's the reason why you want to go with three or four seconds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the process makes sense. The software I use is totally different, but that's okay. It makes sense now. What the changes I've made, this this confirms the things that I'm doing differently now. I understood the discussion a couple, uh, you know, a month or two ago. Thank you. Okay. All right, Dennis, I think. Okay. Um, all right, that was very good. Thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna what I'm going to do, let me share the screen here. I think Gabe had a question. I don't know. Oh, Gabe? Yeah. Yeah, just a um, minor comment on the statement of needing a third to one half the histogram for getting your flats um i think you can quantify that uh, that that's that works for most sensors i think but um i think the rule of thumb is that before you just you know say a third or a half through uh the, up to the maximum of your um your pixel value uh what you can do is measure the linearity of your sensor and the way you do that is using a fixed source and then increasing the exposure time and then seeing how the flux for um, for your uh, re sensor response increases with that exposure time. And if you see any departure from linearity, then that's the moment where you have distortion in your camera yeah. and you shouldn't be in that region. And usually, I think for the old uh, CCD sensors, it was around a third to a half. I don't know how it is for CMOS now. Um, I've actually seen those plots, Gabe, for the 1600 and the 294, mm -hmm. and um, there's some talk at really high numbers, right, where, where the 294 is nonlinear, but that's well below one third, or sorry, that's well higher than one yep. third and one half. Yep. So yeah, yeah I think um, as long as you're in that linear region, you could go, you could probably go higher than the third or a half. Yep. depending on your sensor if it's linear if it stays linear otherwise yeah. It's totally distortion yeah yeah and i think the reason maybe you know because the mean is one third to one half right okay but you know the some of the higher pixels may be closer to that non-linear region right yeah so that's what you need to be careful about yeah good point yeah great presentation good job